Thanks a lot, Charles. I'm really thrilled to be back in Indianapolis uh, speaking with all of you today here at Release Notes. But as most of you probably know, Release Notes isn't just a conference. It started as a podcast. And, and Joe and Charles do it. I think it's every week. And they say something very similar at the top of every single show. It sounds like we discuss inspiration, design, marketing, promotion, business trends, and tools. And then Joe always adds this little, this little coda, this little extra point, everything but the code. So it's a podcast, it's about making apps, but it's not about the code. And that's what this conference is about as well. It's, um, we're not getting up here throwing up Swift playgrounds, showing you how to make better apps. You already know how to do that. We're talking about the other stuff, the harder stuff, the business stuff. But just to have a little fun, let's talk about the code for a second. Uh, <laughs> just for a second. I got some support. Um, at WWC past, this past June, Apple introduced a new piece of documentation. It's really great. It's called the Swift API Design Guidelines. And it explains the Swift core team's thinking on the conventions around writing idiomatic Swift interfaces in whatever apps or frameworks you're working on. But it harkens back to a much older document. Uh, this was written in 2003. It's called the COCO um, Coding Guidelines. And it's it's very, very similar in that it is focused on the style of the code. Um, if I've ever reviewed your code on a, on a pull request, I've probably linked to this a, a few too many times. I'm kind of obsessed with it. Both of these languages, in each of them, Apple is obsessed with the structure of the sentence, how the code relates to a sort of our English language. So you see the English sentence on top, how it would look in Objective-C, and then in Swift. It follows a very similar pattern. I don't think it's a coincidence that Apple thinks about these things in this way um, and that they're so focused on creating these style guides. Uh, I'm, I'm kind of obsessed with style guides too, but these aren't the only two style guides that Apple has published over the years. There's also the Apple Style Guide, which they, hand, they uh, right on the cover, they actually define the word style. Sorry if you have reduced motion turned off. Um, they say it's a customary manner of presenting printed material. Um, and all of this connects back to the Elements of Style, one of the first, most popular English style guides. Um, I worked on a couple of style guides as well in my career, one of them being this one, the Objective-C uh, style guide at the New York Times. But I'm, I'm sorry, I'm getting ahead of myself. Uh, hi, my name is Matthew Bischoff. Uh, you can call me Matt, we're all friends. Uh, and on the internet, I'm MB on Twitter, uh, so you can follow me there. As I mentioned, I worked at the New York Times. That was in 2011, uh, right after I dropped out of school. And I got to work on lots of incredible stuff there with great writers and editors and product people and designers. I worked on uh, NY Times for iPhone, the election 2012 app, uh, which I wish we could go back to that election right about now. Um, and I also helped start NYT Now, which just sadly ended a couple of weeks ago. After that, I spent a few years at Tumblr, another company with a T logo. So. Pattern, pattern matching. Um, first I was an engineer, then I was an engineering manager of the iOS team, uh, and finally I became a product manager where I was managing the, G the uh, GIF Maker project and a lot of what happened on blogs. It was called the identity team. But all of that time, those four years that I was working at those two companies, I also had a secret side mission, uh, lickability. So this is something I've been working on um, since 2009. I've been spending my nights and weekends on it with my uh, co-creators, Brian Capps and Andrew Harrison. They couldn't make it here today, but um, I'm sure they're, they're watching at home. Um, and we're a small software studio in New York. We're four people. We make iOS apps for our customers and our clients. That means that we spend about Monday through Thursday every week working on client work, 80% of our, of our time and, a little, and more than that of our income. And then on Fridays, we work on new products and updating our existing products. We took this idea from ThoughtBot, and I'll talk more about them a little bit later. 2016 has been a cr crazy year for us. These are the products that, that, that we make. Uh, Quotebook is an app that collects quotations. Accelerator is a speed reading app. That's the middle one. And Pinpoint, we acquired from Marco Arment. It lets you mark up screenshots. It used to be called Bugshot, if you're familiar. So this year, we've done a lot of stuff. We, we opened our, our first office. Uh, looks like this. Got our little logo on it. Um, we hired our first employee. This guy named Michael Libertor, he's incredible. Do not steal him from me. Uh, we helped The New Yorker launch uh, a brand new app um, called The New Yorker Today, which is really great. If you love The New Yorker, you should check it out. And actually, while I'm on stage today, 
uh, one of our other client projects is launching um, for Meetup. So after I'm done, maybe check out the Meetup app in the store. It's going to look a lot different. Oh, and we escape the room also, but that's less of a, <laughs> less of a thing. But at all of these companies and through all of these experiences, I kept asking myself the same question, which is, what can I get better at? I think this is a really important question for all of us to ask ourselves in our businesses, in our personal lives, how can I improve? And no matter where I looked and to whom I looked to, uh, there, this always came back to one thing. The answer always came back to writing. So my talk today is called Write Your Way Out, um, which is a reference to this work of genius, uh, the musical Hamilton by Lin-Manuel Lin Miranda, which if you haven't seen it, please do if you ever get the chance. This character, Alexander Hamilton, in, in, the, in the musical, uses writing to solve and then eventually create a lot of his problems. So write your way out. If I had a subtitle, it'd probably be something clickbaity like that, supercharger, well, I don't know. Um, before I jump into a couple of examples of this, I want to just make a quick note. I do not have all the answers. Uh, obviously, I have a ton of luck and, and privilege, and so I don't want this to be the end of a conversation up here. I want to talk to you about all these ideas afterwards. I hope this is a jumping off point. Um, it's not a solution to all of your problems. All good? Okay. So why writing? Why is writing the answer I kept coming back to? Well, first of all, I think it's important to point out that writing is a skill and not a talent. Um, it, it can seem like one of those things in high school or college or even earlier where if you're not good at writing, that's just not the thing for me. I'm a math guy, I'm not good at writing. But, but it's really not like that. It's, it's responsive to practice and it's a muscle that gets stronger the more that you use it. To me, writing is thinking. Um, it's, it's the only way that, that I can really get my thoughts to crystallize. It's the only way that my company can think as a whole and can agree on ideas and make decisions. If those things happen ephemerally in a meeting here or there, it, it never sticks. If it's written down, it does. And David McCullough, the historian, said this too. He said, writing is thinking. To write well is to think clearly. That's why it's so hard. So if you're having a hard time writing something, you probably need to clarify your thinking. Um, this also came up in Sally Kerrigan's great piece for Alyssa Part, which is a magazine for web designers and developers called Writing is Thinking, where she writes, here's another reduced motion moment. She writes uh, this. She says that writing examines all the whys of the job, turning entrenched habits into intentional actions. It equips you with the communication skills to sell yourself and your work to bosses and clients. This is a great, a great piece. I'll let you read it afterwards. But this is why writing, to me, is one of the most fundamental skills that I use in my company and my business day to day. The problems that we come up against, they crave these written solutions. Whether it's money problems, vision problems, product problems, customer support, the solution wants to be recorded so that your team can learn from those mistakes and challenges and not make them again. So I have a few stories, a few lessons, and a few questions. Let's start with some stories. Um, the first time that this occurred to me, this idea that writing was, was this fundamental, was um, in the yellow legal pad. Something I saw a lot in high school when I was a theater kid. And our director, this incredible guy, Tony Braithwaite, would, would watch a run or would watch a dress rehearsal of the show holding his little yellow legal pad and be scribbling furiously the entire time. People were, things were going wrong, transitions were getting messed up, costume changes weren't happening on time. And other things were going really, really well for this run. The first time this dance really clicked or the first time this moment really worked. The whole time he's got these pages and pages of scrawled notes and he sits everyone down at the end of the run and goes through them one by one. He's written everything down and as he gives you the note, as he says, Matt, hey, next time could you do that a little bit faster? He scribbles it off the note. It's this, this action of him giving you the thing and you, if you didn't write it down at that point, that was on you. It was this translation of... Here's the thing that you need to improve at. I've written it down, and you should respect me enough to write it down as well. And I've heard the same thing about the yellow legal pad about Scott Forstall, who famously used a yellow legal pad in tons of meetings, and that's why the, the original Notes app looks like that. But also, when he did have the Notes app, he'd be meeting with you, talking to developers, always jotting stuff down, no matter what, writing everything down. That's an important story for me. Next one is about some bad, bad advertisements. Um, really, really bad ones. So this was at the New York Times. Um, we were having this problem where there are all kinds of things going wrong with our advertisements. In these examples, you can see some JSON just getting 
splat it out into the app. You've got the, an, a house ad from the New York Times that isn't even the right size. We can't even get our own ads right. And then I don't even want to talk about that third one. But, but this was a huge problem for, for me and Brian Capps, who, who helps me um, found Lickability. This was really upsetting. We were both working at the Times full time. And it was really demoralizing to work on this product and build this beautiful shell for this content just to have it ruined by bacon stuff. Um, so we complained about it a lot. We, we talked about it over the water cooler. We, we you know, chatted about it constantly. We brought it up to our managers. And nothing ever happened for years. These ad problems never got fixed, no matter, no matter what we said. But they did once we wrote something down. We built a 38 page, a 38 slide deck. We got the right six people in the room and things changed. That deck circulated throughout the New York Times entire advertising department and the ads got fixed. And this is another thing where a light bulb went off for me that just said, oh, you shouldn't have just been complaining about that. You should have been writing it down the whole time. We would have gotten this fixed years ago. Similarly at Tumblr, I made this spreadsheet. We had this problem where the Tumblr product spanned many platforms. And no one at the company could quite keep straight which platform had which features. So maybe the Android app allows you to send fan mail, but on the web, you've got this other messaging system, and we've partially rolled out things. It's a big product. Um, and that would cause all kinds of problems around launches of new features, around communicating, marketing. Every department was affected by this. So what I did was I sat down one weekend, and I made this. And it has many more sheets, and it's much, much, much longer than the slide allows. But it's a, it attempts to be a spreadsheet of every feature, even the smallest, the smallest stuff, like view source. What does that even do? I don't know. But I just went through platform by platform and said whether we have it. And this spreadsheet is still in use today. Over a year after I've been at Tumblr, I hear people still, still referring to it because this, is, this, is a, this was a real problem. And if, they're, if you're working in an environment like this, you can understand something and you can get it all in your head, but that doesn't help the rest of the organization. Putting it down in a form like this, writing it down, is the actual solution. Also while at Tumblr, I learned a lot from my friend Brian I. Race. Um, he was a coworker there, and there would be occasionally things that would bug him. Uh, first of all, one of them was just that he wanted this thing called a Safari View Controller. Right? This was, when was this? In 2014, he wanted a Safari View Controller. He wrote a nice blog post, a radar, a couple years later, it happened. The engineer that worked on that, uh, you know, and, and the evangelists that have worked on that have come up to Brian and thanked him so much for the ammunition that this written post gave him. It's not a tweet. It's a full-length blog post with a radar, really writing it out. Similarly, we had trouble with building iOS share extensions, a lot of trouble. There's, there's probably eight or nine radars in this post, uh, many of which got fixed the next year because we just took the time to write it down. Uh, also, like Christina mentioned earlier, this was not the original title of this post. Apple did ask us to change it, and we did. So let's move into some lessons. Uh, some things I've learned, um, not everything, but a few. Write everything down, way more than you think. It's, a, it's so important to write everything down because, and, and if you can, in a place that's shared with your team. Um, that way, when you're out at giving a talk at a conference and they're trying to launch something, they can just refer to the stuff that's written. You don't need to be there all the time. Essentially, if you didn't write it down, it didn't happen. And so if you start thinking like this, and you're in a meeting and somebody's not taking notes, you can be like, whoa, what's going on? Is this meeting, are we doing this meeting or not? Because there have to be notes about this. Um, I, an example of this, that also from Apple, is that I've heard that radar is a huge thing in the company, right? Everyone knows that radar is Apple's bug reporter. It's how we file bugs as developers, but it's also how they work on bugs internally. And some engineers get so used to working in radar, they turn it into their personal task list. And you get stuff like this, uh, you know, basically turning it into a shopping list to buy milk. That's how incredibly important having everything written down in radar is at Apple. And I think that's um, a really great lesson to learn for all of us. It's also important when you're writing to think about your audience. And a lot of times, as engineers, developers, programmers, whatever you want to call us, we're writing for computers. And computers are not people. I, I know that's radical. But um, if you need to write for humans, you have to remember that they're squishy, they have feelings, and they respond really well to stories and narrative and empathy. Uh, and, and, and you don't need to, you're not giving them commands. I think, I think that's really important for our industry, too. I've seen a lot of blog posts that, that feel like they're kind of instructions for a compiler and not uh, 
not really designed for people. Similarly, when you're writing, um, when you're writing code, I think it's at first important to write it down in English. This could be uh, user stories, or some people call them requirements, app definition statements, whatever it is. But I, I really don't think you can build a great software product if you can't first describe it just in plain language over a beer and then jot it down in your notebook. Also, I've learned to not bullshit. Uh, I'm trying to be as real as I can up here. Um, I like this, uh, this quote from Harry G. Frankfurt, who wrote the book on bullshit. It's impossible for someone to lie unless he thinks he knows the truth. Producing bullshit requires no such conviction. Um, it's really, really easy to get sucked up into marketing spin, into um, basically not quite lying, but, but half-truths. And I think it's important to remind ourselves to stay away from that, uh, to not use jargon like stuff that I'd have to look up in this jargon dictionary, like open the kimono uh, or, or, or these other ones of my favorite jargon. Um, I, I don't want to hear about your bio break. You need to use the restroom. That's fine. Uh, we're not going to sync up. Let's, let's, just, let's just talk. You're an adult. Use, use simple language that everyone can understand. Um, don't try to obscure it. And that, that leads into saying what you mean. Um, we work in a dense environment with uh, tricky vocabulary, but it's important, I think, to be specific. For instance, I, I saw a lot of web language being thrown around at the New York Times that just ended up confusing people all across the organization. I had to remind people often that um, we weren't working on web pages. We, we, you know, we, were, we were talking to our customers. They weren't just uniques on, on some website. Um, I think it's important that we focus on these differences because they're important in what we're communicating. And the word choice matters. Um, it also matters when you're managing people and you start referring to them like this, like a resource. The people that you're working with and the employees that you hire are people. And it's really important to remember that and use the words to emphasize that. I've also learned, um, I think E.B. White said this, that writing is rewriting. You're not done writing when you finish the first draft. It's a, it's a lot of refactoring after that. It's a lot of, it's a lot of um, editing that's necessary to make it great. And what we do at Lickability to make sure that we do this is we have an open policy. You can, if you're working on an email or you're working on even something as small as a Slack message, you can post that into our group chat and people will help you edit it as soon as possible. That's a top priority to get you the editing help that you need. Because what we produce as a company other than our software is our words. So we really value them. This is a smaller point, but still important. Writing gets you noticed. Or, or maybe being noticed gets you writing, I'm not sure. But a lot of these people, a lot of the people that I look up to and that I count as friends and, and colleagues in this industry, write incredible things all the time. They're, they're, they're tweets, they're prolific on Twitter, they're writing amazing blog posts that get me to think about things in a different way, and they're helping to encourage me to keep writing. So I don't think that's a coincidence, and I think that if you're not writing today and you want to get to where some of these people have, have gotten, it can't hurt to start writing a little bit more. Ask some questions. So, all right, maybe I've convinced you, maybe I've convinced you that the business skill you need to get better at is writing, but what are you supposed to write? Well, I took a look at my Rescue Time, which is an app that sits up in your menu bar and tracks what you're doing all the time, kind of like the NSA. And it told me that I spend 36% I spend of my time doing the thing that you know, I was claiming to do all the time, which is software development, and 20% of it basically writing. That's communication and scheduling is spending time in Slack and in IA Writer and in Gmail. Uh, for, for instance, you know, since I started the company, I've sent like 17,000 emails or something like that. It's a crazy amount of communication to keep everybody in a client services business on the same page, especially internally when you're dealing with subcontractors, your client. Um, but increasingly, also, I'm spending a lot of time just in Slack. We probably use Slack a little bit too much at Lickability. Um, but it's a really great place to discuss ideas, to throw around jokes, new product ideas. A lot of good stuff has come out of it. And one thing that we do that's a little bit different than other companies I've worked for with our Slack is we actually let people who don't work for us join our Slack occasionally. We'll invite our friends and, um, and people in the industry that, that just need a place to hang out that are, that are independent creators to join us. And 
a lot of the times that leads to great solutions to problems. When we can't figure something out on Stack Overflow, it's possible that someone in our Slack already has the answer. And that's happened more times than I, than I can count. Of course, you still need your private areas. We still have private channels in our Slack to discuss private matters. But I think this is an idea that more people should try. And if you've got a really small company, I think you should give this a shot. I'm also jotting down throughout the day tons of notes and tasks. I learned this from David Allen's book, Getting Things Done, um, which basically, you know, if you distill the whole book down, the thing you would take away from it is just to capture everything. Every, everything that comes across your mind that is an open loop, that's something that you need to do that you haven't done yet, put that into some kind of trusted system. I use OmniFocus by the Omni Group, but you can use things or you could even use a notebook. And once you have everything there, organize it, and then you'll, you'll, be, you'll have so much more creative space in your mind to, to work on the problems that you're interested in working on when you don't have to worry about doing your laundry being a thing that keeps popping up in your head. Um, really recommend that book to anyone here as well, getting things done, uh, or just jump in and start getting everything that's in your head, all of your tasks and to-dos, really written down. We also write a decent number of proposals, but not just proposals for clients, um, which we're going over and, and, and writing estimates. Also proposals internally. Uh, before we work on any app or any project internally, we write that down. We write an app definition statement. We basically write what the app store description would look like if that app was available today. Uh, here's an example from Pinpoint. And this will really clarify your thinking and allow you to build the right thing at the right time. Um, this also includes uh, project plans for individual refactors that we want to do, um, competitive analysis, Look, which would be like a spreadsheet of all of our competitors in a certain space or for a certain app. Um, don't just jump into something. Actually, actually plan it, like Greg mentioned, and, and, and really propose it internally if you have a team. Get some, get some agreement on it. Of course, contracts. Uh, David uh, Sparks knows a lot more about this than I do. Um, but one thing I want to say about contracts is that they're not magic spells. Uh, you should be reading them. It's not just your lawyer's job to read your contracts. You should, of course, also have a lawyer who's drafting and, and helping you through them. But if you can't understand something in your contract, it's very likely that your client won't understand it and that you'll end up getting screwed, to use his language. So they're not magic spells. You can read them. You can Google the things that are in them and, uh, and talk to your lawyer if you're, if you're still confused. We also write a bunch of blog posts. Uh, this is the blog post that, that launched uh, the newest edition of the Lickability blog. It was Brian's post about going indie uh, a few years ago. Um, Twitter counts sort of as a blog, maybe. Uh, but these help spread the word about what we're doing and what we're building. And um, this year, I, I want to write a lot more technical blog posts that, because I think we've come up with some interesting solutions, and I want to share those with the community. In the past, I've done that through talks like this one. Um, I think it's really important for you and your team to get out into the community, sharing what you know. Even if it's just a local meetup uh, with a few people, write a talk about what you've learned. Um, I, I promise people want to hear it. I want to hear it. Documentation, not just code level documentation, which by the way, great new pop up in Xcode to add code level documentation. You should try it. Uh, although the code documentation is important, we also document process. First time we hired somebody, we documented what that was like, what, what writing an offer letter was like. And now when we hire someone else, we'll be able to reuse a lot of that documentation because it's already in place. This we learned, uh, th this discipline we really learned from ThoughtBot, who I mentioned earlier. They're a web and iOS and everything development agency. They've been around for a long time. And they have this living document called their playbook, which you should also read. It's really long, but really good. And it explains how their entire business works. Their entire consulting business, their sales pipeline, it's all documented. And anyone at the company can fork that private GitHub repo and tweak it if anything changes. So it's, a, it's an always up-to-date playbook of how the entire business runs. And we aspire to have that as well. Um, this is, we're starting, this is, you know, much less detailed than ThoughtBots, but we keep all, all of our meeting minutes, company policies, uh, instructions for how to set up the printer, even stuff that is simple, we write it down. Um, it's, it's not fancy or sexy, but I, I think it really, really helps. It wouldn't be release notes if we didn't talk a little bit about release notes, another thing that we, that we write. Um, please don't do this. This is, this is lazy, and it's customer hostile, and it, it, it's like you're writing for a computer, right? Human beings are tapping on buttons inside of the App Store, and they're, and they're looking at those iTunes Connect pages 
reading this stuff, and this, this just disrespects those customers. Um, Slack, Tumblr, Medium, a lot of companies, uh, I, ho I hope us and our clients, work really hard on release notes, and I think it remains important, uh, and this, this just grosses me out. I had to, I had to mention that. Uh, I already mentioned a lot of stuff we do for hiring, employment letters, contracts, documentation. This was our spread in the background here for our first employee starting. Gave them some lickable snacks, a little plant. Nice stuff. And once you do this, you can have that as a shopping list for your next one. You can keep improving it. This is what the welcome letter looked like. Really, not a lot of time. A few, a few uh, minutes and pages, drop our logo in there, but it makes a huge difference. We also write a lot of reviews. Code reviews, yes. Uh, GitHub recently introduced a new code review feature that makes this way better. But also yearly reviews of our progress, reviews of our, um, of our applications. And even we try to write reviews of apps in the App Store that we get a lot of use out of. And uh, we even have a blog post in draft right now of all of the tools that we use as a company um, because I think it's important to share that love as well. The kind of review um, after something goes wrong, that's a post-mortem. Uh, we try to make this, th this is something I learned from Tumblr, as blameless as possible. It's not about finding out whose fault the problem was. It was a, it's about finding and fixing the problem. Figuring out the answers to questions like, how did this happen? How can we prevent this in the future? How did our systems fail us? And writing down all of those answers to stay accountable uh, when things break in the future. And the second question is, well, all right. So I've heard a lot of stories. I've heard some lessons. How do I get better at this? If I'm not good at writing, what do I do? And I don't really have an easy answer here. The only thing that's worked uh, is this. Uh, shower, uh, lather, rinse, repeat. You, you write, you edit, and you keep writing. Um, no tool is going to be a panacea. You can go to this fancy pencil store and buy all the fancy pencils that you want, but that's not going to make you a better writer. Um, so you really need to, if this is important to you, if you think that this will help your business, you need to get up a little earlier or make some more time in your day, schedule some time in your calendar to, to do some writing. Um, even though tools aren't the solution, I'm going to recommend a few anyway that, that have made this a little bit easier for me. One is a journaling app called Day One by Bloombuilt. Uh, it's really great. It'll remind you to write at the same time every day if that's a, a workflow that works for you. Um, it's beautiful. It syncs. Go get it. Uh, and another is, is similar, but it's a web app uh, by, originally by Buster Benson called 750 Words, which is built on this idea of morning pages, where you get up and you just bang out 750 words in the morning, get it done, and try and do it every single day. Uh, I, I did that for a little while. I should probably get back into it. Uh, it's a really great habit to be in, and it will improve your writing way faster than you think. And three books that I really like as well. Uh, Stephen King's On Writing, I've read that twice. It's incredible. Uh, if you're more interested in writing nonfiction stuff on the, from the business side, On Writing Well by William Zinser, I think it just got a new edition. Incredibly good. And Annie, Annie Lamont's Bird by Bird. All of these are, in some ways, expanded style guides, too. And so let's go back to that concept of style guides that I introduced in the beginning. What would a style guide for your company look like? What would your playbook be? And what's the answer to that question I asked earlier of the thing that you want to get better at? Thanks so much.